Welcome to the Vice Casting Couch, Season 1, Episode 3. Uh, today we'll be talking about Google's naughty activity and China spying on Wiggers. With a W. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, with a U. It's a, it's a, it's a group. <laughs> Don't sue me. Uh, <laughs> joining me today is <laughs> John. Uh, Aaron cannot be with us. He is on a business trip right now um, and does not have a lot of free time. Uh, so, John, why don't you lead us off with the story? <laughs> about the Wiggers? Yes, about the Wiggers. So basically, um, Google's, I think it's their Project Zero, uh, they identified a total of, uh, they identified some vulnerabilities uh, that were focusing on iPhones, and th- but this campaign was also focused on Android and Microsoft operating systems as well. Okay. But uh, basically, the campaign is sought to infect computers and smartphones of the Uyghur ethnic group in China, and the community has long been targeted by the Chinese government um, in this particular uh, Xinjiang region. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, China doesn't like them too much, but, but in total, so that Google's Project Zero, they discovered 14 vulnerabilities, hmm. seven for the Safari browser, five for the kernel, and uh, um, another two sandbox escape exploits. Jeez. So basically, um, where was it? But like they could, once you're in there, they can look at everything the device is doing. Um, it could read encrypted like WhatsApp messages and Telegram. It could get live like location data. Wow. Um, so a <laughs> message. Basically, full control. <laughs> Yeah, full control. So, from my understanding, um, I'm trying to find it in the article, but you, once that application restarts, yeah. so like it would, uh, once your phone restarts or the device, it would go away. But like, who really restarts the devices that frequently, you know? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> for me, it's like a weekly basis of that. But basically, with the Safari exploits and everything, you would just go to a infected website and, mm-hmm. um, then boom, they have like full control over your device. Wow. Okay. Is that is that only in like China's intranet uh, thing, or is this like any? Can anyone get to this website? Um, they never really explicitly said what websites were affected, but it sounded like it was okay. multiple. Jeez. Okay. But it seems like this was some kind of mass surveillance operation to, taking place on the the Uyghur civilians. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Because they face all kinds of persecution in that specific yeah. Zhengjiang region. I, I could be pronouncing that wrong, but then, mm-hmm. uh, because there's also like surveillance cameras scattered across that region with facial recognition and everything. Oh, yeah. They were, um, I saw an article saying that they were trying to put up like fake birds or something. Oh, really? Uh, for, yeah. And they had like the, they had like a camera, a facial recognition camera in the eye of like the fake bird. <laughs> And they would like perch these birds around the city or whatever. So people obviously weren't, you know, were none the wiser that it was, you know, something spying on them. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, that was, uh, I don't know if that, that was true or not, or if that was like an allegation, but knowing China and hearing stuff like this, I would not be surprised. So I don't know what, it, um, what exactly China has against these people, but I do know the Uyghur population is a predominantly Muslim. Oh, so- Okay. Maybe trying to have something against these Islamists. Trying to push them out or something. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Uh, oh, and as for the pronunciation, we <laughs> we looked it up, and this is what they said it, it was pronounced <laughs> as. <laughs> we, we looked it up before the show. It's, 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 it's spelled, spelled with a W. a U. Yeah, it's, no, I, mean, it's a, I mean a U, U. a U. <laughs> yeah, not with a W. It's spelled with a U. <laughs> Obviously, it'll be uh, in the article, but damn, those police um, trying to get you, Ryan. I know they're coming <laughs> for me because we said Wigger. <laughs> um, but no, it's spelled with a U. It's not any sort of uh, racial thing. It's just the it's how their name is pronounced. But um, I want to say this: um, these exploits have been patched. Um, it has been disclosed to Apple, and I want to mm-hmm. say. Um, it was patched in iOS 12.1.4 update, but... Oh, for, okay. So they are patching it. Yes, yeah. It has been disclosed, but I, um, from what my understanding is, this predates back to iOS 10, um, from what I was understanding. 
Oh wow! That's, I'll try to include all the links in the yeah. post. There's a lot of them, but um, mm-hmm. a, another good explanation: Hack Five. They did this on their threat wire. Mm, okay. Um, so you know Shannon over there does a good job breaking everything down. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. So, okay. So it, since this has been going back since iOS 10, that's what like three years, two it, years. It's been a while. I, China's been like focusing on these people for some years, like with surveillance and imprisonment of the of the Uyghur population. Wow, I don't know. It just the stuff that happens in like like China and Middle East and stuff. Just I don't know. For me personally, anyway, it kind of blows my mind. Like that this is. <laughs> this is still happening, I guess. So, <laughs> like stuff like this. Yeah, a, a lot of the details out there, like they they mentioned that it, there was focus on Android and Microsoft, but they didn't really say what exploits happened, if how far they got. Like, there's a lot of focus on the iPhone, um, but yeah, but yeah, there's yeah. not much about that I can see. Looking through these articles on the uh, on the Android and Windows situation. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, because everyone touts iPhone as being, you know, <laughs> there's no viruses for iPhone. No, there is. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of them, actually. So, according to Business Insider, says Chinese authorities have detained somewhere between one and two million Uyghur people in prison camps. Um, and they're trying to claim Jeez. it as a counter-terrorism measure. So, I think it has something to do with them being Muslim or something. Wow. Jeez. So, what, uh, like, what region are they in in China? Is this, like... Is this- Zhang Jing. Um, I like I said, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. I'm not Chinese, you know. Probably. <laughs> it's this particular region that's uh, closer. It's on the the um, western side of China, closer more to like Pakistan and all that. Okay, all right, okay, that make that makes sense. I was gonna say, is it closer to like the Middle Eastern countries that like yeah, it's, they it's, border it's, with? It's closer to like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, okay. and like Tajikistan. Looking at the okay. map right now, that makes sense. So this was who found this vulnerability again? Who found it? Um, yeah. So the Google Project Zero, um, they were like the ones to find it, from my understanding. Okay. Um, it doesn't really say. Um, it doesn't have a particular name that I can see, but it's, okay. it's just interesting how they there at least two of these exploits, to my understanding, are zero day attacks. And then the other ones yeah, have kind yeah. of been just persistent. Um, mm-hmm. And so, like, they combined all these with the Colonel Safari and the Sandbox Escape. Um, yeah. To, like, Jeez. just do all of this. So it's pretty crazy. I, I'll include all the links. Like I said, there's a lot that kind of goes over everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is the, the Google Zero Day? No, Project the Google Zero. Google Project, Project Zero. Zero, yeah. Um, I didn't look too much into it, to be completely honest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm guessing it's some sort of like vulnerability finding, um, like pen testing. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is. Um, I was just wondering because I mean, I've been <laughs> so, my stories are uh, anti Google. So. Oh, oh, really? So from mm-hmm. for, from the quick search I just did, um, it makes it seem like there's a bunch of security analysts employed by Google uh, that are tasked mm-hmm. with just finding these zero day vulnerabilities and um, stuff that. Criminals or state-sponsored hackers, intelligence agencies would would uh, want to find and stuff like that. So, like, they just kind of mm, okay. make it aware to everyone. Uh, okay, let's, at least that's, that's, that's kind of what Wikipedia is saying right now. They've been a thing since 2014, apparently. So I, I haven't heard about <laughs> them until now. But yeah, honestly, doing all this uh, like more you know research than I, than I normally would do. Um, I found a lot of like independent and um, sponsored like uh, white hat hacker groups. Uh, it's crazy how many there are. Like uh, like on Twitter, um, I can't remember their oh malware hunter. Um, apparently, they're like <laughs> they're finding vulnerabilities like left and right. Um, they're a uh, European based um, team, I believe. I want to say Sweden, but I'm not positive. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, I, I don't know. I never even knew that they existed like before. And then doing this research and stuff where they're, they're finding these vulnerabilities and making them public to, to certain companies. And I mean, potentially saving people a lot of time and money. Um, and I mean, possibly, you know, lives, uh, like in, in this case with, uh, China targeting certain groups. 
Well, um, we could talk about other bug bounty programs too. Um, I didn't mean to bring up this story in this this one, but we can talk about it. it was, it's fairly mm-hmm. recent, but Hacker One they handle this bug bounty program and it includes a lot of companies, but Valve is one of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, this dude disclosed a uh, a bug within Steam. So like, if Steam is installed on the on the computer, they can like, from my understanding, they can like drop malicious files and stuff onto your computer. Um, mm. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. And it's a, like a local privilege escalation bug. And so the funny mm-hmm. thing is, Steam didn't really see it as like really their problem, just because of how it's a local a user thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then because of, and then accidentally Hacker One banned the guy from the bug bounty program. <laughs> so the guy got super pissed and released it to the public because they didn't want to fix anything. And then so now like they're trying to like backtrack and deal with that situation. Uh, oh my words. <laughs> It's quite funny when you think about it. But. Yeah, I know I, we like lightly uh, talked about that earlier, and I just I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> this guy was like, hey, there's a problem with your software. You probably should change it. Steam's like, nah, just ban him. <laughs> he can't talk about it if he's banned. <laughs> so, so from my understanding, it was an ac- they claim it was an accident, um, but... Quote, unquote. Yeah, quote, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> allegedly an accident but so like this uh, oh, threat man. post is saying that the privilege escalation vulnerability can allow an attacker mm-hmm. to level up um, any program to run with the highest possible rights on a Windows computer as long as Steam is installed Jeez. so like yeah, you could yeah, go yeah. from like you know relatively minimal rights and then boom you're running a system and then you can just do whatever you want essentially uh, and then yeah that's a pretty big vulnerability valve says they then published a patch and then the same research researcher said it can be bypassed as well so like there's just all kinds oh of stuff Lord. going on with this jeez wow well that's uh that's good to know as so so they put out a patch but the patch can be bypassed there's a workaround yeah like so like it sounds like it wasn't they didn't spend that much time on it because there's been a lot of cases like um jeez this is a this is gonna be an old topic, but back in the day, uh, a jailbreak me was a website. You could go to your iPhone, mm-hmm. and then you can just click a button, and it would jailbreak your iPhone for you. Yeah, and, um, I remember that. Yep. What was that guy's name? But basically, so the guy he he focused on like doing these super simple jailbreaks um, using like mm-hmm. Safari, and um, he would he like Apple patched it, but he was still looking at it, and you notice like he would still get like these weird like. Um, reports and whatnot like just looking at like mm-hmm. all the the um, safari logs and stuff like that and yeah, so he yeah, realized yeah. they didn't patch it 100 percent. so he was able to tweak his um exploit and work around it and <laughs> the interesting thing about that one is that guy um he was able to like it was actually safer to jailbreak your phone at the time because he would automatically patch it so his his name was comex or something like that okay and um so there was a lot of jailbreak me's. There was a one, two, three, just, four, and then basically they all, from my understanding, focused on using the Safari web browser. Gotcha. Be it, I just love how these companies, I mean, they, they have to have fully dedicated teams or something that patch these vulnerabilities. Mm-hmm. And then there's like one guy or one person on the outside who just gets around this whole team's like... Uh, patching to try to get the to keep this person out. I don't know. I think that's <laughs> there's something to that. That's either the teams are uh, you know not doing what they're supposed to, or this person should probably be hired by the company because they're doing a better job. No, yeah, it's completely crazy. I want to say, don't quote me on this, but I want to say Comex got hired by Apple after his like one of his jailbreak me's came out because. Oh, really? Just like, just imagine Apple's, like, how they look. It's like, oh, yeah, you visit this website, and you can jailbreak your phone. Yeah, yeah. Because most of the time, you have to hook it up to your computer and run software and do kind of stuff that yeah, most yeah. people would be kind of uh, uh, leery. Oh, apparently, it no longer works for Apple. This was pretty recently. I just looked it up. <laughs> oh, really? The jailbreak yeah, the me? Comex guy? <laughs> so, Maybe after they hired him, he patched himself. <laughs> yeah, there's... So apparently he worked for Apple for a period of time, but then now he no longer does. Oh, okay, but. Hmm. that's crazy. Well, I'm glad we talked about uh, 
the the good things uh, Google, Google is doing. Well, well, and what made light of the uh, Uyghur population, you know? <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 that too. <laughs> with the U, everyone. Um, with the U. <laughs> with the U, yes, not a W. Uh, uh, so I have two stories here. The first one I'm going to go over um, involves uh, a company called Basecamp. Uh, so basically Basecamp, um, they're like a hyper project management uh, tool. They mix like scheduling and group chat to do lists and storage, blah, blah, blah. Um, they combine like a bunch of standalone apps um, like Slack, which is a, a chat app and Asana, which is a to do list, Dropbox, etc. cetera. Um, so they basically put that all into one software, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, for companies to use. And they, I guess, tweeted out uh, that Google was putting uh, ads of competitors ahead of their organic link. So if you Google, like I tried this as well, and it's true. If you Google Basecamp, it, uh, there'll be like two or three uh, ads above the Basecamp link of competitors for Basecamp. And the competitors are like, I looked it up and the compet- the ads that came up, there were two ads and one of them was Slack, which Basecamp mentions in their website and Asana, which Basecamp also mentions in their website that they, they have a cheaper like version because they combine all of them together. Those two competing companies were in the ads above the organic link for, for Basecamp. And, uh, the, uh, CEO and co-founder, uh, Jason Fried, uh, he tweeted out and he said, uh, uh, when Google puts four paid ads ahead of the first organic result for your own name brand, you're forced to pay up if you want to be found. It's a shakedown. It's ransom, but at least we can have fun with it. Search for Basecamp and you may see this attached ad. So they, he, he paid, uh, Google to put an ad right above his, above his uh-huh. own link. And, um, the, the ad said basecamp.com. We don't want to run this ad. We're the number one result, but this site lets companies advertise against us using our brand. So here we are a small independent company forced to pay ransom to a giant tech wow. company. That's what the, that's what the that's ad pretty said. Savage. And Google put it. I know. <laughs> I know. And Google put that above their, uh, um, the first organic link for, for Basecamp. Um, so they filed a complaint. Um, oh, and as well, like you, you can't really tell that they're ads besides the tiny little green, yeah. you know, the, the AD next to it. Like I've, I mean, I'll admit I've accidentally clicked on ads on like Google and, and other websites and stuff because they look so similar to organic yeah. search results. Um, and that's, and he brought that up as well. Um, he said it's so easy to miss. Uh, the ads look more and more like organic results instead of them being like a different color. I think they used to be like a, they used to be in bold or yeah, something, like, something that. like that. Um, it's like a bold blue. Yeah. And so you, you, they were obvious that they were ads, but now they just look like normal stuff. Um, but anyway, Fried um, also said the company has filed complaints about trademark violations with Google um, for ads that use Basecamp's name. Um, so how was Basecamp? And said so? that ads. Uh, B A S E C A M P. Oh, they, they must have fixed it because I tried searching it right now and I, I see Basecamp.com as the top result. Do you have any uh, ad blockers? Oh, yeah, I do. One second. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, there is a Sada Monday. Yeah. Tryoutreich.com. Yeah, I'm telling you. It's crazy. Yep. It's crazy. Yep. So, yeah, that's, I don't know, that blew my mind. But anyway, they filed a complaint and they said that they, that other companies were using their name, Basecamp's uh-huh. name, in their ad above their, wow. above their search result. Um, so, so ads saying like, Hey, we're just like Basecamp. Like that was completely fine with as far as Google is concerned. Um, but that obviously is a trademark violation. Yes. So this is trademark so, and copyright it, and all that, and Google still allows yes. all this to happen. Yep. Google does not care. <laughs> so in a statement, uh, a Google spokeswork, uh, spokeswoman said the company prohibits the use of trademark terms in the text of an ad if the owner files a complaint. Our trademark policy. Balances the interests of users, uh, advertisers, and trademark owners. Uh, the statement said, provide users with the most relevant ads. We don't restrict trademark terms as keywords. We do, however, restrict trademark terms in ad text if the trademark owner files a complaint. 
So basically, you have to police the Google platform for your own trademark to to try to find people who are using it. Otherwise, it's completely fine with Google. And they're the ones running that. Google ads. being so, so big, they could have like a. I want to say trademarks are publicly available, right? Um, you think mm-hmm. they just have a list, and they could just have some script look over it, and then if it flags, you would then think if it like flags or something, <laughs> you, you could think. have like a you know a human look over it and be like, is this the same company or is this an alternative company like you know a competitor or something like? John, stop, stop, stop. stop. Oh, 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 you're right. You're right. This, this is- <laughs> Google is out to make money, okay? Ah. <laughs> if it doesn't make the money, they don't care. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, yeah, basically, you have to go through and find <laughs> find competitors that are breaking the law, basically, mm-hmm. trademark violation, and then you have to file a complaint with Google for every uh, violation for Google to do anything about it. Hmm. And, I don't know, that just... To me, that I don't know, that blows my mind. Um, so other people weighed in on this on this tweet uh, after it after it kind of went viral. Um, and Santa Clara University law professor Eric Goldman, um, who has written exclusive or extensively about Google's uh, ad policies and how they're terrible, um, he said this has been going on for fifteen years. But every now and then, a trademark owner wakes up and freaks out. They feel like they're paying to buy back customers they've already mm-hmm. acquired. Um, Goldman says courts have made have made it clear that trademark owners can't prevent rivals from buying their name as ad keywords on Google's platform. And in 2018, an appeals court ruled that the contact lens company, uh, 100 contacts, um, engaged in anti-competitive practices when it entered a series of deals with competitors not to purchase certain keywords. Um, this is something Google will go to war over. They're making so much money on keyword ads. They'll spend millions of dollars to defend it in court. Um, and I mean that, that's absolutely true. I mean, Google is making so much money. They're making money mm-hmm. hand over fist on, on their ad revenue um, and selling data. And I mean, there's no way they're going to, they're going to stop that. That's not, <laughs> they would take such a cut from actually doing something about this issue. Uh, however, the justice department is uh, reportedly looking into Google's uh, digital advertising search operations um, as authorities pre- uh, prepare an antitrust review of tech giants marketing power. Uh, more than 30 states are also considering their own antitrust uh, investigations. Um, the company could face uh, billions of dollars in fines if anyone actually does anything about it. Yeah, so antitrust, uh, what that means is basically uh, United States antitrust law is a collection of federal and state government laws um, that they regulate the, the conduct of organizations and business corporations, stuff like that. Um, to try and promote a more fair um, competition uh, for for customers. Um, so basically, the Justice Department and these states are saying Google's trying to corner the market on everything it can, and obviously that can't that can't be allowed to happen. Oh. Yeah. So so, so <laughs> kind of crazy stuff. And this isn't the first time this has yeah. happened either. In 2013, uh, Google um, had to change some practices after it agreed with a settlement with the, the U S uh, federal trade commission, the FTC, um, cause they were concerned about some, uh, practices in 2010, uh, the European commission, uh, regarding the ranking of shopping, uh, search results and ads resulted in Google actually being fined $2.7 billion. Um, so the, the Europe is actually doing a, a lot about this. Uh, they also find them, I think $5.1 billion, um, in 2018. So last year. And I think, Oh yeah, it says in this year, in March, uh, the European Union also ordered Google to pay 1.7 billion. So Europe is actually doing a lot more than the than the U.S. is about this issue. But yeah, it's it's well, freaking crazy I think to it's, me. Yeah, you know, they might be fined a couple billion dollars, and while it definitely is a dent, like the overall company, uh, according yeah. to GoBankingRates.com, is worth just under 280 billion. So Google can Jeez. totally. Um, and some some say it's even higher. They say Alphabet, which is Google's parent company, is valued at seventy three yeah. seven hundred and thirty nine billion dollars. Um, so I guess Google itself wow. is worth a little bit less, but Alphabet, the parent company, like they totally have the money. And yeah. I think finding them might be in the right direction, but I think different things. And it, 
need to it's be not put enough. in place to make it a, you know, where these companies will actually listen. Because we, we see it with Facebook. We see it with, you know, all these companies. Yeah, they get in a negative rap, but no one stops using them. It, everyone's oh, yeah. still using them. Um, no. They're still no. making tons of money. Like, Facebook is still going ahead with, like, their Libra stuff. They're still putting ads. Like, Cambridge Analytica, it yeah. might have hurt them a little bit, but nothing, nothing is... Um, it's not like shaking them that much, you know. They're not, yeah, they're not stopping anything. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the only way that the company, these big tech companies, will actually listen is if they start hemorrhaging. Oh, exactly. Money. If they start hemorrhaging money, then everything will change. I mean, I would say within hours, like their policies would change if they were hemorrhaging money. Um, and yeah, I mean, they are getting charged billions of dollars, but I mean, are they really changing anything? I don't, I don't really think so. Like if, if this has been year after year that they're getting fined by the European commission, um, and the European union, I mean, I don't know if it's year after year and they keep doing the same thing, they're just habitual offenders at that point. Like, I, I don't know what else you can do besides trying well, to bankrupt them. I'm not sure either. Maybe maybe increase the fines so we're actually staying. It seems like these companies, <laughs> Yeah. I don't know if they know they were doing bad, but it seems like um, they don't mm-hmm. react until someone else, like they're reactive, they're not, pro, they're not proactive, you know what I'm saying? Uh, yes, yes, So absolutely. I think they're just like, we'll make money as long as we I can mean, on this method, and then then once we get fined. Yeah, and that, that that's exactly like, what we see because they, I mean, the people who run these companies aren't stupid and they have, they have a whole department of attorneys and lawyers that, that they consult with. There's no way that one of them didn't speak up and say, uh, Hey, maybe this is, this isn't legal. Maybe we shouldn't go this route. Like I, I find that extremely hard to believe that no one looked into the legality of this when even, I mean, just logically thinking about that, excuse me, like, oh, hey, if we're going to put, uh, you know, we're going to put ads in front of this, uh, this organic link with the name of the person <laughs> in the competitor's ad, we're just going to throw that in there. Well, that's okay. Like, that, that so, doesn't even make sense to anyone, let alone like I'll a give giant Google corporation. A bit of the doubt. I wonder how much like people actually do look at these ads. Like, I feel like a lot of it could be automated, you know, like, um, oh, well, apparently they're getting tons of money for it, so someone's looking at Well, they, at it. they might just get paid the money and be like, ah, oh, your ad, and then someone, maybe maybe not a lawyer at face value, might just look over it and be like, ah, it doesn't seem that bad, or something like it. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe. Um, to me, personally, it seems like, like you said, they're just, they're like, well, let's see how long we can get away with this. Most people don't care. Most people don't look at the ads. Um you know, just throw it in there. We'll see. We'll see who you know who cries wolf first, and then we'll you know we'll we'll say, oh my goodness, we're so sorry. We'll change it. I don't know. That, that's what it seems like to me, anyways. We don't but, know the full picture, um, but it definitely seems very yeah. shady. Well, yeah, obviously. I mean, I don't work for Google, um, but yeah, I guess just recently Google has been coming under pressure in the U.S. in the in the uh, in Europe. They've been they've been monitored, like I said, back for, since 2010. Um, I guess President Trump has even uh, criticized the big tech uh, companies such as Google uh, for political bias. I know this was a, mm-hmm. a big thing during the election where people were saying that different results were popping up in different areas based on demographics. Um, the same thing with uh, with uh, YouTube and Twitter. Um, so Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren actually uh, pressed for breaking up Google. She wants to, to break up Google into separate entities. So basically like, uh, Google, Nest, uh, Waze and like YouTube, those are, those would all be separate companies. Um, that's what she wanted to do when, when this came out that they were going to, they were going to find them. Um, uh, she said, uh, current antitrust laws empower federal regulators to break up mergers that reduce competition. Wait, so you said, and that, that's completely true. If there's a monopoly. Mergers. Okay. You just kind of broke yes. up there so, for a second. Uh, so according to, oh, sorry. Um, yeah. According to the, to federal law, if a company like, uh, like look at, um, mm-hmm. like Comcast or something like that, 
if Comcast just decided they were going to buy out every other uh, company that was a competition to them, the federal government has the authority to break up that company to separate. Into well, separate, so we uh, gotta companies. we gotta think about it from like when these laws were passed. So like these laws were passed when Standard Oil was a thing, uh, and when they did practices like I'm mm-hmm. gonna buy up all my competitors. So they bought up, you know, I want to say they bought up Exxon. Yeah, and I believe. Um, who yep. else was it? Was it Shell or BP? There, there's a bunch. They bought up all these oil companies just to make themselves the one oil company. Yeah. But yeah, see, yeah. Google and all these tech giants are operating mm-hmm. in a different environment now. So while they might be the leading search engine, there's they're not buying up Yahoo or Ask.com or DuckDuckGo. You know, um, they're still like. Well, yeah. it, it wouldn't make any sense to them because <laughs> then it would totally make them look like that. Like everyone, they're like, oh, let's Google it. Like it's in our language now. They're not like, well, let's let's Yahoo it, you know, let's ask yeah, it, yeah, you know, true. type things like, <laughs> yeah, let's bang it, <laughs> let's bang it. Thank you. Yeah, thank thank, <laughs> thank God. God. <laughs> but uh, you know, but so like they're they're operating in a different way. Um, it's it's not horizontal. It's not a vertical monopoly, but it's it's just like some kind of weird, just octopus. Because like YouTube, YouTube was um originally was started yeah. by like three dudes from PayPal, and then now Google bought it. But there's still yeah. other competitors out there. There's a uh, there's Daily Motion. There's Meta Cafe. There's um, what's the one that starts with a V? Vin- mm. Vinimo? Vinimo? Yeah, Vin- yeah, Vin- Vinimo. Vinimo. That's, or not that's Vimeo. Um, yeah, not Vinimo. not the payment yeah. thing. Not Venmo, but uh, <laughs> but no, yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, there are there are plenty of alternatives. They just they never get the traction that they that they could because everyone just goes to youtube because it's well, and what so a case do. could be argued that because um, google is the leading search giant and nothing um against their competitors it's just google just won in that regard like i don't know if it was because they were there first or because their search their search algorithm was pretty um pretty good from my understanding so so maybe there is some kind of yeah, bias yeah, towards yeah. that because oh these are google owned assets we will prioritize these more and i haven't seen any research based off this is all speculation right now mm-hmm. Um, a theoretical discussion, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, but do you think there is a point where a company becomes too negligent and too large to oh, uh, exist? Most definitely. Like, but we're we're in uncharted territory right now. Like, look at Amazon. Amazon is disrupting all kinds of things. Like, they're not they're not horizontal or vertical uh, monopoly in the traditional regards. But they're tackling every industry, like or yeah. at least they're trying to. They have they have streaming services, they have shipping, they have uh, devices that you know are pretty good in most regards. They're making their own shipping services. I've seen Amazon vans um, going around my area. They recently built a Amazon warehouse, and so like hmm. to me, that's a direct. They're directly competing with UPS and FedEx, and even the United States Postal Service because they're like. You guys aren't giving us the best rate. We'll yeah. just make our own yeah. shipping company, you know, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and they're just doing all kinds of things. I, I want to say Amazon <laughs> owns airplanes for shipping stuff. Um, yeah. Am- Amazon is crazy. Really? Like, when you look at it, like they are arguably, I'd say they're more of a, a threat than Google is. While well, Google is, you know, has their problems, but Amazon's a monopoly. Like they're in everything. Yeah. 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 yeah I don't know. I just, I don't. I don't like when companies get this big to the point that they're that they just don't care. It just becomes statistics and numbers. Um, And like, there are a lot of big companies that still care about their users and still, still take feedback and are proactive. Um, But when I look at companies like, like Google and Facebook and, uh, Mm -hmm. and YouTube, which obviously is owned by Google, it just doesn't seem that way. It seems like they just kind of do whatever they want. And then, if you don't like it, you don't like it too bad until they actually get fined or until there's like a, an actual public outcry. So I find it funny. I typed in Amazon monopoly on Google and look, so like the first, uh, what four links, they're actually like, you know, articles by like Forbes and all that stuff. And then a couple, yeah. the next two links after it are like for the actual monopoly board game for on Amazon.com. <laughs> so. Nice. <laughs> Oh, so I thought goodness. that was a little yeah. funny. <laughs> Amazon doesn't want you looking into it. Um, so there was a bunch of companies that um, that also spoke up uh, about this, saying that they were they were fed up with with how Google was uh, running their ad campaign. 
Um, so the CEO of Spotify, uh, or st- sh- sorry, Shopify, um, Tobias uh, Lutke, uh, shared and weighed in on uh, Fry's tweet. And he said, it's totally crazy for Google to get away with charging what's basically protection money on your own brand name. Nice, uh, nice high intend traffic you got there it would be a shame if someone, something were to happen to it. Uh, <laughs> which I don't know if that's a threat yeah, or that's what. A uh, <laughs> but, um, I mean, there, there are other people who are, who so are angry exactly? about this. Uh, the CEO of Shopify. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and other, other companies, uh, um, tweeted about this as well. Uh, Booking Holdings, the parent company of Booking.com, uh, Priceline and Kayak, um, uh, has long uh, counted on Google for traffic, spending billions of dollars a year on ads and search uh, engine optimizations. But last month, the company uh, said it has observed a long-term trend of decreasing performance marketing returns on investments, a trend we expect to continue. Um, it had shifted some of its marketing spending uh, from search to other means of advertising away from Google. So companies... I don't know. I think they are getting, at least some companies are getting, are getting negative results from investing with Google and are starting to look elsewhere, which I mean, honestly, good for them. I mean, if I wonder how negative though, because Google is the, the premier giant in this space. Like yeah. the average public doesn't view Google as negative. They, they might've heard some slightly shady stuff, but they have no problem going to their phone and Googling them. Oh, or yeah. using anything affiliated with Google, like YouTube or um, Gmail, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. Like, yeah, this gets into a much bigger discussion. But all the data they're collecting on us is absolutely absurd. Oh yeah, I mean, I don't know. That's another thing that kind of, I guess, pisses me off. It's how complacent people get. Um, like with the uh, Mark Zuckerberg, he went in front of freaking Congress. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they pointed out a bunch of BS that he was doing and he admitted to it. And then he just went back and people just kind of didn't care. Like there were memes about him being a robot and that was about it. Like, <laughs> I don't it just, I don't know. It kind of blows my mind and how just a overly adaptable and complacent uh, people can be when they're, they're dependent on a certain platform or something like that. Like well, I understand a lot of these platforms and, and websites and stuff like that. They're very easy. They're very integrated. They're user friendly, but there are alternatives to, to this sort of stuff. Um, I mean, Facebook, I don't know, but um, like, I mean, to like Google searches and stuff, they're, they are completely like, I don't know, vastly better alternatives um, to stuff that we do every day. If we just take like five minutes to change. So I think part of this comes down to the complacency of like the general population, like, uh, like they're so used to one thing and they don't want to change it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we've seen this with Google, how they've kind of, I wouldn't really say stole. They've definitely seen what their competitors have done and done something like that. Like for instance, yeah. um, duck, duck, go. So like, you know how you type in like two plus two. On uh, Google, and it tells you four, and has like a little calculator popped up. Yes, yep. So Duck it's like Duck integrated Go, applet. Yeah, so Duck Duck Go was a, was the first search engine to kind of integrate that, and then mm-hmm. Google kind of like took that, put their own spin on it. So like Duck Duck Go would only focus on facts, like yep. It, like so, if you search something like a definition or you know two plus two stuff like that, it would show you the answer. Where Google, it's like you almost search anything, and some little some little thing pops up. Um, yeah from whoever and has its own little spin on it. Like, um, and then also like, you know, if, if people really realize how much power they have, like as a collective, not as an individual, but as a collective, Mm -hmm. you could definitely, um, cause all kinds of disruption in this space. Yeah. And I, I don't think people realize the, the tools that are available to them, um, to, to show companies because companies don't care what you say. Uh, especially big, uh, not all companies, obviously, but like Google and, and YouTube and Facebook, um, and even, even Amazon to some, uh, t- to some extent, they've shown over and over again that they, they don't really care about the feedback that people give. They only start to care about their business practices when it affects their bottom line. Um, and I know it's, it's kind of a, you know, a cliche or whatever, you know, in all the movies. Um, you know, big company just wants your money, blah, blah, blah. But in this, in this situation, it, it kind of seems like that is correct. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and people don't understand that they, they're the, they're the, the, the item that these companies thrive off of. They thrive off of your data and they thrive off of you clicking on ads. That's what companies pay Google for the majority of it. And if you take that away, Google hurts and then they might listen to what, <laughs> to what you want to say. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't think people realize the, the vast tools that are available for them. Um, and the power that they actually wield over these companies, um, they're not too big to fail. No company is too big to fail. Well, you're getting Especially into when you have- some different territory right now. Uh, we don't determine who's too big to fail. I, I, I just want to make sure it's clear. <laughs> well, yeah, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just saying no company, like no company can, can not be affected. You know what I mean? Well, and especially companies that thrive off of your data and stuff. I mean, so if you, we're going to talk about this in, in particular, let's look at Equifax, which just became recent in everyone's mind again with the whole settlement and everything. Yep. Um, they, by many analysts, they had what was considered an extinctionary level event. Like their company's going under, like this mm-hmm. is their sole job. Like, so what I want to say was 150 plus a million Americans. Uh, their information was leaked and they're a credit reporting agency. You think they would have top tier protections on this stuff, but there's yeah. still a company and w- what they're offering the people like is not that great. Like you have a better chance going to small claims court and getting more money from yeah. them yep. than what their settlement has came out. You either get um, identity theft monitoring or you get, mm-hmm. they say a hundred, I think it's $125. I, I, I could be um, off on that number. But they only yeah. allocated so much money. So if everyone tries to claim one hundred and twenty-five dollars, you might end up getting only three, or something like that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so like, uh, yeah, it's almost um, a better. Aaron was talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron was talking Last about time. that, but it, it's almost better to take the um, the the monitoring service than it is mm-hmm. to try to get any money from them. Yeah. It's and it's more worth your time and money to just get the service and they're going to still persist as a company they haven't gone down like equifax is still i'd say they're still going strong i don't know about their exact like stock value or anything like that but yeah, yeah. it hasn't dropped massively or anything like that yeah and to me that's oh that's that's crazy they lost so much info and they're still just there persisting uh to me that's that's insane it is um, like insane. obviously, I mean obviously you know everyone makes mistakes. Whatever companies are are no different, but w- when a company's sole purpose is to protect you, and they fail at that, they shouldn't exist as a viable company anymore. In my eyes, like yeah, and, and, move over and give way to someone else who can do the job better. And and we can't like we can't tout this exactly because like how how would we change this? This is very the very like kind of touchy space when we start thinking about it like. Yeah. I'm trying to think how to word this, but <laughs> no, I, I think I understand what you're saying. Like, I mean, it, it's not easy to just completely secure something on the web. I mean, there, there's always, I mean, I mean, me and you have learned there's no such thing as 100%, you know, risk, uh, risk free. It's all risk mitigation. So something it's all how much, how much risk are you willing to take on board? Something I like to tell um, Aaron is like this whole cybersecurity thing. It's a big cat and mouse game. And what I always tell yeah. them is, uh, you know, the mouse will always win, but the cat will be well fed, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So like, there will always be vulnerabilities, but like, the people going after them. Yeah. No, I, I definitely agree. I mean, there's there's always going to be holes in in security and stuff like that because I mean, there there has to be, um, and that's a whole different discussion with with uh, um, IT security. But I, I get that. But it's just. I just feel like there should be more that happens. There should be more consequence to a company. Um, because otherwise I don't see any, I don't see any initiative or any reason why a company would care then if they can just lose this much data and then people just continue to use them and they stay a viable company and they keep making money, then what's, what's the incentive to actually protect people? I don't, I don't get it. Uh, I mean, I could start up a company tomorrow and say, oh, yeah, we'll keep your, your info completely secure. And then I could lose all their info and then it doesn't really matter. So I don't want to say laws because laws are extremely slow to change and especially with rapidly moving technology. Um, yeah. I would almost want to say like some kind of promissory note, like saying that we are doing the best we can. But mm-hmm. even then, that's a little, 
like sketchy, but I just looked up some identity theft statistics. And so in 2017, 6.64% of consumers became victims of identity fraud. So that's about one in 15. But overall, 33% of U.S. adults have experienced identity theft which is more than twice the global average. So I, I definitely think there is something with U.S. companies being, I would say, uh, not doing their due diligence on... Negligent? Uh, you, you could claim them as being neg- negligent, but um, I, I don't know how we would fix this. I don't I don't see a good solution. You know, I, it's glad that we're talking about it, but we until someone comes to the table with a good solution, like I kind of think it's going to be something that's going to happen, like... Someone you know will experience something in their lifetime, if not you yourself. Yeah, and and I understand that. I mean, I mean, even today, the internet and the idea of identity theft and stuff, it's a relatively new concept. And I understand that nothing's going to be airtight. Um, pe- things are going to happen. Bad things happen to people every day. Um, and, you know, with an evolving culture at, you know, integrating the internet so closely into our lives, obviously that's going to become a factor. It's going to become a risk um, to everyone, but it just seems like there, there are much better ways. I don't know. There's just much better protocols to put in place and policies and ways to, to conduct um, your protection of people. That seems a lot better. Like, like a, uh, last last episode, we were talking about um, using a common access card type system. Wow! Um, and obviously, that would be you're getting into some huge to push out some dangerous territory, um, especially when we're talking about nation state actors. While we don't have the capability now, common access cards or mm-hmm. the, the technology like that relies on the PKI system. And yeah, once quantum computing comes out, public key infrastructure is going to be completely destroyed. Like. Being, you know, the whole asymmetric oh, keys well, and the yeah, public and okay. private, they're based off of each other. And quantum computing is so far ahead. Like, um, but, but there is a couple states that have done this. I want to say, what, Estonia or uh, Latvia? One of, one of those two. Yeah, it was something like that. Yeah, we talked about it last time. But I think we should just be careful about implementing certain things like that, especially for something like a government. We've already seen Russia try to interfere with our elections. Um I was reading something that just because... Allegedly. 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 (laughs) I was reading something that just because of the wide variety of voting systems that we use, that some of them couldn't be uh, tampered Mm. with just because of how different they are. Uh, I want to say state from state. Don't quote me on this. I don't have the exact source in front of me. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, it is different. Um, I know that uh, because, yeah, I've I've heard several people from different states say that. I mean, some people still use the freaking pen punching (laughs) thing uh with the with like the electron Mm -hmm. readers or whatever like like (laughs) like the testing things a little circle of the bubble so yeah i mean all of them aren't electric even i mean some states are still using the freaking paper which personally i'd be okay with i feel a little safer just using paper and pen but i don't know maybe uh maybe it's more secure i don't know the the encryption or anything they use um on the voting machines. The I'm not entirely ones. sure either. I just know, I think it was, it was either a year or two years ago at DEF CON, they had the voting booth hacking village there where people were just completely ah. like destroying these voting booth machines, like in all kinds of things. Jeez. Um, I don't have all the exact details in front of me. I'm just kind of going off memory on that one. It definitely was yeah. a thing. And, and I definitely think it's something that should be. Oh yeah. At, not, but not surprised. Jeez. Well, the, uh, the second story I have here, um, again, involving uh, Google. So this was, uh, this was involving... <laughs> the, <laughs> no, not a vendetta, just a topic of interest currently, um, just with what Google's been, been doing kind of behind the scenes. Uh, so Google and YouTube, or aka Google, um, will be paying out... 170 million uh, to settle allegations by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, um, and the New York Attorney General that YouTube illegally collected personal information from children. So this is from their um, their website and from the the children's app, uh, the YouTube Kids app or whatever. Um, so basically, according to the Children's Online uh, Privacy Protection Act or COPA, children can't without a parental consent. They can't let companies, they can't agree to companies to take their data. And this is, uh, this has been a longstanding, uh, policy. This has been a longstanding law. But Google thought, well, that doesn't matter. We're just going to do it anyways. 
So, <laughs> so basically every time a kid would, would click accept on the terms and conditions to get into their site or, or what have you, they would just start collecting no matter what. It didn't matter who it was. It didn't matter the age. Um, they just started collecting. Uh, they found this out. The FTC found this out and the New York, uh, attorney general, um, as well as, uh, 23 advocacy mm-hmm. groups. They've been lobbying against YouTube, I guess, for years, um, about them collecting, uh, data on children. And then, uh, finally, uh, the, the federal government got involved in the state government. I mean, again, 170 million really isn't a whole lot for Google to pay out, uh, for this. Uh, I mean, their alphabet company, uh, it says here that they generated nearly $10 billion in income in the second quarter, in one quarter of the year. So um, does it say exactly what kind of information? produced $10 billion. Dollars. Does it mention any specifics? So I don't know. I, I don't know what it was at the time. Um, so I actually downloaded the, the YouTube Kids app and I went through it. And that's I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to what they actually collect, but it's basically the same as everything else. Um, like your IP, your device info, uh, location info. Um, and then they, they just end it with unique identifiers, whatever that means. So it's not anything specific to that child in question. Uh, it, well, I mean, any of their info, like watch history, uh, what they click on, their search history, uh, stuff like that. Okay. Um, so it is their data. So what Google said that they'll do, YouTube uh, CEO Susan uh, Wojcicki, um, in a blog post said that starting in four months, YouTube will treat data from anyone, from quote, anyone watching children's content on YouTube as coming from a child, regardless of the age of the user, end quote. Is that for all of YouTube or just YouTube for kids? No, no, no. Just for their, just for their uh, videos that are specifically for kids. Okay. So children's content, they have a separate, separate identifier for children's content and then their normal site. So YouTube will also stop serving personalized ads. They say they will, um, on this content entirely that just the children's content, obviously not the, not their actual website. And it will disable certain features, um, on this type of content, like comments and notifications. The comments and notifications, I'm pretty sure they already did that because, uh, shocker, there was a, <laughs> there was a, a pedophile ring on YouTube. Um, and I guess they, <laughs> this, this is not a joke. You can look this up. There was a pedophile ring on kids, uh, channels on YouTube and they, they were leaving some pretty disturbing comments on these videos, like disgusting comments. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, I'm pretty sure they already took comments off of, uh, uh, kids videos because of that issue. But anyway, so a lot of the creators um, of kids content, the actual creators that, that, you know, don't produce weird content. So they said that they were going to start losing money off of this, obviously, because there's no personalized ads and there's no comments or anything like that. So how are you going to like track user interactions, stuff like that, uh, besides just like watch time? So I guess YouTube has established a $100 million fund that they're going to distribute over three years to, they said, dedicated to the creation of thoughtful, original children's content on YouTube and YouTube kids globally, which leads me into my second point. YouTube, YouTube for kids is a nightmare. So, uh, James Bridle, uh, he did a tech, t- uh, Ted talk last year and it was, it's, you can look it up on, on YouTube, um, ironically. Uh, and the title of the, the video is the nightmare videos of children's YouTube and what's wrong with the internet today. Um, so he, he talked about this topic extensively and he was saying that a lot of videos, um, just throw in a bunch of keywords into their titles to get kids to watch the video, the buzzwords and hashtag words like Paw Patrol or Frozen. And that basically just, it just makes it a meaningless jumble of, of titles. And then there's autoplay, the oh so helpful feature of YouTube. Um, to keep you, or in this case, your kids watching video after video and bridal showed that within eight to 10 videos being chosen, and this was just a year ago within eight to 10 videos being chosen for a child to watch, um, from the, from the autoplay feature, he went from a video of a children's song like wheels on the bus or whatever to Mickey mouse masturbating in a theater. <laughs> <Whoa>. so, what? <laughs> Yes, oh, this is this was God. an actual video. He shows it on the screen in the back, and it's just Mickey Mouse in the front of a theater, just going to town, I guess. 
Um, there was another one from a different article that showed um, Spider. It was like a Spider-Man video or a trailer to a video of superhero characters getting murdered on the beach. So it's just, and these, and these videos, uh, parents have also confirmed reports of their children becoming paranoid, becoming afraid of the dark, um, or just traumatized. So after this kind of came out a year ago, it kind of blew up. Um, and YouTube did state that they were going to have only humans monitoring the kids YouTube app. I don't really know how that fixes the issue though. Um, because I mean, if you're going from an algorithm that makes mistakes to humans that make mistakes, I don't, I don't really see how that fixes the issue, but, um, I guess. Hopefully these so anyway, humans what I have found, a good moral compass. Well, exactly. I mean, you're hiring some, some dude and bridal brings us up, um, in his video. He was like this. Now you're just having some underpaid person who has to watch all these videos themselves. Mm -hmm. And I mean, who knows if, yeah, like you said, hopefully they have a good moral compass and they think, you know, that this shouldn't be on a kid's app, but whatever. So what I found, so if you just search, just, um, on, on Google, uh, if you search disturbing videos found on kids app, the YouTube kids app, um, there's dozens and dozens of articles of parents, um, stating that they found videos themselves or they had their kids tell them of videos within the quote unquote safe app, um, that had horrible or just adult content. One video had a, had suicide instructions. Oh, I think I've heard about that one. Yes. Or there was just, there were ones that were just kind of disturbing. Um, I actually watched this one. Uh, it was a, a baby's head like spliced onto a dinosaur's body and it was like singing like a nursery rhyme song. I mean, to me, to me, to me, that was, it was kind of interesting. But then I thought, what if a kid is watching this? Like that could be very disturbing to a child. I mean, for me, it was just kind of, I was kind of like, oh, whatever. This is just a weird video, but a weird video to, you know, to you or me could be traumatizing to yeah, a kid. Who knows? Um, but yeah, one, who knows? exactly. Who you knows don't, how the you don't kids know the are child state turn out in 20 years, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But anyway, um, so that one article about the, the suicide attempts uh, was made public by Dr. Hess. Um, she's a, she's a pediatrician and the video in question states, so there, it's sandwiched in between this nursery rhyme song. And then there's this little clip with the narrator and the narrator says, remember kids sideways for attention, long ways for results. End it. And, and then it goes back into the nursery oh rhyme my God. and then it goes back into the nursery rhyme. It's, <laughs> it's just put inside this kid's video. So Hess said uh, she sees more and more kids come in, and that was just from earlier this year, February of this year. And and uh, Hess, who's a pediatrician, uh, says she sees more and more kids come in with self harm injuries and suicide attempts, and she links them directly to social media such as YouTube um, for this uptick in these types of cases. Um, Hess said she also kind of went on a hunt um, on YouTube in the children's content to find other videos with adult content, and lo and behold, she did to include uh, school shootings and overtly sexual undertones um, in, in certain kids' videos. And even even if most of these videos aren't just outright like evil, like those videos, most of them are mind-numbingly trash. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, they're just straight garbage. In my well, that's opinion. a different discussion, man. Like that—that that is a different discussion. But on the, I again, I downloaded the YouTube Kids app. I spent like an hour and a half just kind of going through random videos. And I mean, what kid needs to sit and watch a two-hour video of adults dressed in like rip-off Halloween store Disney costumes singing the same song over <laughs> and over and over? I mean, <laughs> after five minutes. I would have found a suicide instructional video to be refreshing, to be honest. <laughs> this is, I'm sorry. It was so, just... Man, oh it's crazy because like, uh, I, I have a sister and it's quite young. And she knows how to get to the YouTube app like faster than anyone. Like She'll just be sitting there on her mm -hmm. tablet doing whatever, watching these videos and like... Yeah. And seeing all these things. And the autoplay feature's on, so it just it just plays these videos one you know, after the other. Sometimes she clicks other things, but other times she just lets it play. So like I think it just depends on the, the kid. Yeah. And is she on the like the YouTube app or the YouTube like kids? Uh, I'm not sure what app she's using in uh, particularly, but okay. I just know like she's always watching those dumb little animated videos and Oh yeah, yeah. Like freaking Peppa Pig and 
all that well, crap. Well, stuff related to that, because from my understanding, these people specifically target making something similar to Peppa Pig or Paw Patrol. Yes. Or Frozen. Yes, exactly. And then, boom, next thing you um, know, like, suicide instruction. <laughs> yeah, there's this... Uh, so there's this, the, the finger family song or whatever, and Bride will actually show this in the background of his video. Um, and I found the, the original video. It's the finger family song. So it's like, you know, where is, where is so-and-so, where is so-and-so mm-hmm. here I am, you know, like the normal, like little finger song, but they use like characters. This <laughs> Someone made a video and said like finger family song, blah, 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 with like a, a cutesy little thumbnail, but it's like Hitler. Um, and, and like Osama bin Laden and it would just, it's, it's really weird stuff. I don't know who, like, I don't know who sits down and thinks that they're going to make this video for kids and it's going to be hilarious. I don't know. That is, it's freaking weird. But, um, when you said that your, your sister can get on the app quite easily, um, it reminded me of, so I guess YouTube kids app to set it up, there are some like controls, quote unquote, Um, so I download the app, you open it up and there's two options. One says I'm a kid and one says I'm a parent. If you hit the kid one, the button, it just pulls you back to the main screen and says, have a parent sign you in. It's just, you have Mm. the two options. Any, any kid who can read is going to hit the parent one. And any kid that doesn't read, (laughs) is just going to hit the other button when the first one doesn't work. I mean, you got a 50, 50 chance if anything. So anyway, you hit, you hit I'm a parent and then it comes up with a, a uh, super basic math problem. And it came up, it was like, what's five times three or whatever. It was, it's always like a multiplication problem. So anyway, they, they come up with this, this math problem. And I mean, any kid who has any sort of knowledge of search functions is going to just be able to, to ironically Google this and, and get the answer right away. Like this isn't, this isn't a problem for kids. The next thing that comes up is the notice of consent. And this is where basically the parent gives Google the right uh, to take your kid's data um, because it says, you know, it says it'll take device info, IP, you know, all that, all the normal stuff. And then the last one, it says that they will collect unique identifiers and there's no explanation as to what that exactly is. They give like some examples, but they're super, super broad. So whatever unique identifiers are with, it can, just, it can mean anything. And then link, um, that data to provide targeted ads. So it does say that it will provide targeted ads, which I thought they said they were going to take, um, targeted ads away, but they said that they will use the data mm-hmm. for ads. Um, then they state that they do share this info with other companies, but only with parental consent. And like they make that a big deal, but you just gave your consent because you clicked okay. So this is basically how they're getting around the, the COPA violation that they were called out for mm-hmm. is they're basically you, quote unquote, have to be a parent to set up the app. And then you click, I agree, or I accept. And you're basically, that's how they're getting a, a, around the COPA thing. Cause once a, once a, a parent or a guardian gives consent for them to take data from a kid, then they have full rights and they can take data from, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are. If you're on their site, they can take your data uh, because a parental uh, guardian or, you know, a parent said it was okay. Hmm. So yeah, just very, very strange stuff. <laughs> yeah, def- Google's definitely looking out for their bottom line right there. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean they don't. As I said before, I mean, I don't. I don't mean to be. You know, I'm not Alex Jones here or anything. Like I'm not trying to be. Uh, I'll be honest. I, I'm a little bit retarded. Uh, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not trying to be like a conspiracy theorist or anything. But like, it's just a fact. Google does not care about their users, in my opinion, like they should. They, they're not protecting, uh, they're not protecting the people that use their, uh, their platform. And they're definitely not, they don't, definitely don't, you know, distinguish between kids and adults data. They don't care. All they're looking out for is their bottom line. Just the fact that that's true kind of disturbs me. Well, and like we said before, we, there's no like clear cut solution for all these, uh, these, these stuff that happens, like, especially with mm-hmm. the kids and whatnot. Like, yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't even know a solution for myself. Like, yeah, having humans go over the videos would be better, but what if some dude's having a bad day and he's like, you know, screw this. I want these kids to watch these suicide instructions or something. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's just, I don't, I don't know if, if you're a parent and you just let your kid have free reign on a, on like the YouTube app. I mean, 
But it's too easy, know. so it's too easy. It, it is, and yeah. that, that's that's the problem. It's way too it's too user friendly. Well, not too user friendly. Well, I don't think any can be too user friendly. But it's just it's super easy just to be like, "Hey, kid, go on the app while I you know take a nap or something." And I'm sure that I, obviously I get it. Like you can't you know if you're a single parent or something like that, you don't have time to do stuff like well, that. Even in today's but, modern society, where having um, both parents work is almost a norm now just because yeah like, yeah that's true we're, we're not going to get into all the details behind it um, but no no, no. just no, because no. of that yeah just because of that like I know I come home I don't even have kids and I'm exhausted like I'm like oh, damn I gotta I gotta call the bank you know <laughs> I gotta, <laughs> I gotta do these I have responsibilities <laughs> yeah exactly like I could I can only just I mean, imagine having kids how what that kind of burden would be on you oh yeah oh yeah I mean Props to any any parents out there. I don't I don't have children either, and yeah, I mean I I get freaking frustrated with the stuff I have to do. So I mean I can't even imagine. But like one thing I I guess I would suggest is okay. So there's a few options that I can think of. YouTube does have a watch list, right? Mm-hmm. You can go through videos yourself and just kind of skip through. It takes like you know five seconds to skip through a you know a half an hour video, and just make sure there's nothing weird, maybe. I don't know. Maybe it's just a a type of precaution. Obviously you're not going to be able to catch everything, but maybe just make a watch list and then like, okay, this watch, because I mean, you can build up a watch list pretty, pretty long. Um, I think mine in the past like week, I think my, my like watch later list is like, I don't know, a couple hours long. Oh, let's not even Um, talk about my watch later list. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So like, it's not that hard just to click a video and be like, okay, this seems, you know, it's a normal Peppa Pig episode. There's no like suicide instructions or freaking, you know, sexual undertones and, you know, just throw it into a watch list and then maybe give that to your, your kid to just, cause it'll play video after video or like Netflix, they have a kid's app and it's not user generated. So like maybe that's a safer alternative to this. Yeah, um, I would argue, like, if you are a parent and you're concerned about this, I would either do traditional cable or over-the-air television or something like uh, Netflix's kids. Because having yeah, kids watch yeah. stuff that's generated by other people and it has no kind of, like, checks, you're just asking for trouble right there, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. So. There's always going to be some weirdo out there who thinks that this is hilarious or, you know, whatever, whatever the motive is, there's always going to be someone like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and all you can do is try to mitigate that risk as much as possible. Again, you're never going to be able to completely erase all the problems that your kid may have. But I think this is, this is kind of an easy area, um, to avoid stuff like that. Um, either create a watch list yourself and regulate it yourself or yeah, the, the Netflix, uh, kids app. Um, where it's actual productions rather than just people uploading random videos. Like, I mean, like the, the little bridal also brought this up in his Ted talk, like the little kinder egg surprise videos, like the unwrapping videos. Mm -hmm. What, what kid needs to watch that? I don't understand. Like it just gets them hooked onto the video because they, you know, they open the box and they open the egg and they get a little dopamine burst in their brain. They're like, Ooh, look at the new toy. But like, what, what, what is that doing for the kid? So I went, as I said, I downloaded the app. I watched about 20 to 30 videos on the YouTube kids app. Yeah. I'm not proud of it. I'm not <laughs> proud of it. And I'm probably dumber for it, but that's exactly my point. There was only two videos. I would say that I actually thought, wow, this might benefit a kid. Most of them were just, as I said, just mind numbing trash um, uploaded by these users. It was either unboxing videos I don't know, nonsense in my opinion, regardless well, of, think, of what app they're it's, on. It's, I think I think it's the same kind of like psychology and all that stuff with adults because we watch unboxing videos for stuff we don't own all the time. Like, you're telling me you haven't watched one unboxing video of some kind of tech gadget and you're like, damn, you know? like Maybe, <laughs> but if it doesn't have any review or anything like afterwards, probably not. Like, I know there's a bunch of unboxing channels on YouTube, and I, I, out of curiosity, I've, I've clicked on their channel and watched a video. But if there's nothing, if there's nothing afterwards, why? Like, I watched this one guy. Um, he, uh, he unboxed, um, the newest, uh, I think it was the Galaxy 10 when it first came out or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, cause I was, I was looking into it cause I wanted to get it as my next phone. Uh, so I watched him unbox it, but then he gave like a tech review afterwards or like, uh, uh, what's his face? Uh, Linus. Linus Tech Tips or mm-hmm. whatever. 
Um, he does like unboxings kind of, and, but he gives a review afterwards or he builds whatever's in the box or, you know, you know what I mean? Like there's something afterwards, but with the kids, like the toy unboxings and stuff or the kinder egg unboxings, they literally just peel off the egg, open it up and show the toy. And then they move to the next one. Like there's no, there's, there's nothing like there's no meat to the video. Um, well, I've no, I've, I've which, watched I mean, unboxings. I don't know. Um, like when Ryzen, I want to say it was their Threadripper came out. Like, so a lot of these YouTubers, they might receive the product in advance, but then they sign an agreement that they won't post a video actually showing uh, performance specs and stuff like that until uh, a certain date. But they can show the unboxing, so they have these cool unboxings. And I'm not going to lie, I watch those sometimes, like, and um, yeah. stuff like that. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I guess. I mean, I, but, like, I just think it's interesting. A, and, you a know, two year old, uh, or even like a. A four or twelve year old to be watching that hours after hours of just like I don't know it it just doesn't seem beneficial to me at all like like I said there was like two videos there were like two videos that that were quote unquote educational one of them was like kind of showing the justice system um, a little bit I guess and the other one was like it it was learning about the planets. And like, I was like, okay, this, this video is actually pretty educational. Like this is like, you know, this reminds me of watching like the discovery channel back in the day or something like that, but it was put in like a very kid friendly way. Like they were singing about the planets and and blah, blah, blah. Um, like that, I was like, okay, this, I, if I had a kid, I'd be fine with them watching, watching this, but like, I don't know, just the, the normal trash that's out there for kids on, on YouTube. Just, I just don't see the point. Like there's so many there's so many alternatives that you can, that you could have besides just the, the trash that's on, you know, kids YouTube. I don't know, man. In my personal opinion, anyway, <laughs> but I don't know. I just, it just bothers me when, when big companies like this don't have any regard for, I mean, like kids of all, of all age groups, like you don't even value a kid, like a kid's privacy. I, I don't know. It just, it bothers me, but. I don't know. It just, I think we're way too dependent on these big companies and we let them slide with way too much. And there, there just seems to be no repercussions whatsoever. Um, as far as these like big tech companies are concerned, they stole kids data, obviously against the law, which again, I don't know how they didn't see that it was against the law. Like you said, whatever we'll give them, you know, <laughs> we'll give them the benefit of the doubt, but it just seems like to me, how did no one think or their, you know, their, their group of lawyers or attorneys, how did no one bring up the legality of this and say, Hmm, this, this might be a little immoral and, uh, oh yeah. And it's blatantly against the law. Like, I, I don't, I don't see how I, no one in this big tech company thought to bring that up. I don't know, man. We don't know what goes behind those meetings. It's always kind of like, well, always this reminds me of is back in uh, Mr. Robot when um, they had a, <laughs> they were talking about how they they set up a fund regardless because they knew like if something was to come out and they were talking about how this fund already grew you know like six times mm-hmm. based off of yeah. stuff like that so yeah no I I totally agree like and again I'm not saying you know you know big company bad take them all down I'm not I'm not saying that I'm just saying when companies habitually act like this over and over and make decisions strictly based on their bottom line. It's just, I just don't, I I have no respect for that company whatsoever. And like you were saying before, we do have, we do wield vast power when it comes to these big tech companies. Um, Like Facebook, for example, like if you stripped, if everyone stripped their Facebook down to just their like close friends and family, didn't put their birth dates took off like their cell phone number off their, off their site. Didn't like anything like pages, page wise of like interest Mm. pages. I mean, Facebook would have not a whole lot. All they would have is like targeted ads and that would kind of be it. Like they wouldn't be able to sell a whole lot of data if there's not a whole lot of data to sell. And I I don't know that there's such an easy thing that people can do. Like over the past a couple of years, like two or three years, I've been slowly, kind of cutting off my social media presence as much as I can. Like I still have a, a Facebook cause I keep in contact with, you know, uh, certain friends and family through there. But like a lot of stuff is stripped off of my, my page 
and like, I don't have a Twitter anymore. I, uh, um, I don't have an Instagram. I don't have a lot of the other social media stuff just because I don't like that. If I, if I can live without it, I would rather live without it, I guess is what I'm, is what I'm trying to say. Like if Facebook went down tomorrow and just went bankrupt, my life would go on. Like I, I'm not that integrated into the site. And I'm glad I'm not integrated uh, that far into the site and dependent on it because, uh, to me, that's scary. Well, there is other alternatives out there. One of it is people don't know and people don't see the reasons. Like, why should I change this? Like, yeah, there's all kinds yeah. of open source, uh, privacy respecting kind of uh, social media sites and stuff like platforms. But yeah. trying to tell your grandma about Mastodon or, um, or some of these <laughs> other ones. I'm trying to think of the other ones off the top of my head. Yeah, no, there, there definitely are alternatives, but people, and there's always the argument of, well, if, if I have nothing to hide, why do I care? And that's not the point. Like the point is that they're, <laughs> they're basically learning everything they can about you and stalking you around the internet and then just selling that to the highest bidder. And no one really knows who that is because once you give consent, the company can do whatever they want with your data. I mean, that that's what the terms and conditions are. You give us full rights over what you do on our site and we can then track you around the internet once we install the cookies or whatever. Um, to me, that's, that's frightening. Like that's, and there's easy ways to, to combat this. If you are, if you are interested in, you know, in, in blocking that sort of intrusion. I mean, like I said, stripping your, your social media of, of any identifiable info. Well, I know for Firefox, using a VPN. Uh, there's an extension that once you close a tab, it wipes out any cookies that are associated with that tab. Yes, exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, I have that on my, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, um, yeah, I have that one. Um, I also have uh, Adblock, obviously. And if you want to support a site or something like that, like there are several sites and, and YouTube channels that I like to support. You just click pause and then you watch the video with the ads like it's not that hard but then when you go to other places like uh like google or what well i don't use google but when you go to other sites and stuff it just blocks the ads so they can't you know it doesn't display it doesn't install the cookies and everything i don't know it, or you can just use a, a like a vpn and a tor browser um if you really want to go incognito i mean the tor browser erases everything there's no script which stops certain uh like java um applets from running on, on certain pages and stuff like that that you don't need and it does break some websites and you have to turn it off but i mean for me the benefit outweighs the the inconvenience of using you know third-party stuff like a vpn or a tor browser for me anyways i, I don't know i mean if you if you really care about stopping it there th there's some really easy ways to to go about doing exactly that there's all kinds of ways to, uh, like, if you're really worried about your online presence, there's all kinds of ways just to remove all your information. Like, there's a book, I forget who it's by, but you essentially it goes about how you can send letters to these companies and go through the process of saying, hey, I don't mm -hmm. want my information on your platform anymore. Like, and, and they have to comply, like, yeah. to an extent. Yeah, I, I want to look into how effective that is. Because I know, like, yesterday I tried to... Uh, I don't know. I found uh, in my Windows settings for some reason the like uh, collect data radio button was on. Um, I think that was from when I like reinstalled Windows. It turned it back on. Excuse me. And um, so I tried turning it off, but every single time I would close my settings, it would just it would just turn on again. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> so I got to figure that out. But I want to see how effective that is because there's a button on there underneath it that says clear my data. Um, well, what size? And I don't is know again? exactly Sorry what. About that. Uh, this is this is from Windows. This is in settings. Oh well, see, th that's the thing. It, it's even creeping into our operating systems. Like Google, I mean, Microsoft is getting all kinds of telemetry from Windows 10. Like people yeah. say, Windows 10 is one of the biggest privacy like threats to us. You know, to yeah. this day, because like it's what runs everything else. If they can see all that stuff, like we, yeah, we have a lot to worry about. And I've personally yeah. made various tweaks to my Windows to. Um, mm -hmm. Same. To pr try to prevent as much of that as possible. I've even installed Ubuntu as a, uh, a dual boot OS. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's that, that's a good alternative. Um, or, or learn, yeah, learn Linux and then just use Linux. It looks basically the same. I mean, you can tweak Linux and Ubuntu to basically whatever you want if you know what you're doing. If you want the Windows experience or whatever, I mean, it's not that hard. But yeah, I've, I've also made uh, tweaks to my window just to try to, I don't know, just to try to save some of my, like, <laughs> data, I guess. 
um, from being ripped from my fingers. But it, I want to, I want to look into that to see exactly what that does, how, to what extent that, that, that actually works, like writing a letter to a company or clicking clear my data. Like, do they just move it to a out of country server that's out of the jurisdiction of your request? Or they just like, do they prioritize that data to sell it as fast as possible? So it's not on their server anymore, quote unquote. Like I, I want to see if anyone has actually done research into this and, and sees what happens, but I don't know. That's a, that's a whole nother, whole nother podcast. I'm trying to find the book though, but there's a book written by a good uh, security researcher and he goes on how to uh, like remove yourself from the internet. Um, mm. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. But he, he talks about like if you want to be completely anonymous, like you're going to have to take sacrifices. I think I think it's this book. It's by Michael Bazell, and I want to say he like he works with the Mr. Robot cast on making sure everything is at least somewhat uh, feasible, you know, like like these Oh, okay. but he has, his book is hiding from the internet, eliminating personal online information. And it's a long book. I actually have it on my Kindle. Um, and he goes through like everything from like Equifax, Experian to Facebook, all these all stuff. I didn't even know. Like there's companies that like, it's like credit monitoring, but it's more in regards mm-hmm. to, um, like how many checking accounts you have opened, you know, uh, different utility mm-hmm. bills, um, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. And then he goes in like different things you can do, like Firefox, Tor, uh, the Tails, stuff like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Tails. How to make anonymous purchases, you know, getting an anonymous telephone, all kinds of stuff. Like he, he, it's pretty thorough (laughs) on the public websites. Like even the white pages, you can request white pages not to have your information on the website anymore. And, um, (laughs) yeah, just different stuff like that. Like some of these you have to, you have to actually print out something and, mail it to them um which is yeah. unfortunate but like they kind of have to you know uh comply to what you're asking yeah yeah i i just i wonder how that how that works um like what the what the legal backing for that is i guess um because if you hit if you hit accept that they can take your data and they have your data and then all of a sudden you send them a letter to retract that i just, I just want to know like at, at what point like, you know, with most things in life, that would be obviously, you know, you're within your legal right. You know, if you, you know, whatever, if you have sex with someone and they decide that they don't want to have sex anymore halfway through, technically you have to stop. Otherwise it's rape. <laughs> so like. Don't make them drink the tea. So like, we, exactly. So like we have that, but like that's, that's a well-known boundary um, or should be anyways. But. I just want to know, does that work the same way in, in tech? Like you were saying before, I mean, all this stuff is so new. These issues that we're running into are, they're very new and there's not a lot of laws that protect people from this. Um, so I just want to know like what, what actual legal backing is there um, to say, yes, as soon as you get this letter from that point on, you can, you know, you have to delete every single piece of info you have on this person. I just want to see like if, if companies are able to get around that or if that's just a, uh, you know, a uh, no holds barred, like you have to do this or else. Well, I think, you know, you could do some things like you could probably take it to like court if you really wanted to, if you're so hell bent, but most of the stuff isn't that yeah. complicated. Like, I think there's only a couple, um, sites that he mentioned you had to do something like that. And he talks about like what exactly to write. Oh, okay. Like he has a okay. template for the letter you can write and um, mm. all kinds of stuff like this. That's um, helpful. And it really is a good book. I, I tried reading through it and it is a little dry because like a lot of it is like, Go to Facebook, do this, do this. And then he just kind of goes down for all these different services. And then he actually mm-hmm. does get down into like, you know, antivirus, what what operating system you should use, what search engine settings, you know, hmm. VPN, all that stuff. Um, he has, oh, wow. Does he, does he update this as well? Um, so I know he has a website called Intel Techniques, but that's more focused on okay. OSINT. So, but this book, it, um, came out in okay. 2018 It's the fourth edition. So it is relatively new. It's not something that's super dated. Uh, mm. Okay. Um, I was just wondering cause if he's gonna, if he's making recommendations on like VPNs and stuff, but I, I know his um, Intel techniques website, it's really good. Like I said, it's more focused on, um, OSINT, uh, but he also does the, okay. a lot of privacy stuff and he has a blog and you can actually have some live training you can attend or online training if you're into all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I was, I thought it was funny when, uh, um, I was watching a bunch of, uh, tech channels like back in the day that would, uh, they were being sponsored by like tunnel bear. 
Um, and like, uh, <laughs> and then tunnel bear, obviously like you found out that it was not a secure oh, VPN. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I mean, any free VPN be very careful with, um, cause most of the time they're also skimming data right off the top. So it doesn't, you know, you're not really doing so it anything. looks like he's made a new book called extreme privacy and what it takes to disappear in America. Mm. So there's that okay. too. I would look into that one. I haven't read that one, but I imagine it's, it's. From the brief description I've read, it seems very similar. He helps like billionaires yeah, and celebrities just kind of disappear from pu- public view and stuff oh. like that. This guy is very well respected, um, at least in the security community from what I understand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sure he is if he's writing freaking books on it that, that people, are, uh, <laughs> people are buying. If you don't have anything else to talk about, I think, I think I'm going to wrap this up. I, I agree. Um, I... I just want to say, and I'll just leave you with this thought. No matter how integrated or dependent you are on a website or platform or big tech company, if they do not care about and protect their customers, I believe that we have to voice our disdain and like outrage with their current conduct. And if they do not change, then we do have the tools available to take money away from them um, until they comply or crumble. And then I guess just hope that the next entity to take their place gives us the basic human respect and dignity that every one of us as users deserve. But that's, that's my personal opinion anyways. Uh, but I don't know, just looking at all this stuff just kind of, kind of ticks me off a little bit. So, <laughs> but, and don't be a wigger in China. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You might get targeted by the Chinese if you're a Uyghur. <laughs> oh, my word. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.